I'm Nicholas Fernandez. I'm a computational scientist at the Human Immune Monitoring Center uh, here in, um, in New York City at the Icon School of Medicine in Mount Sinai and former postdoc in the Myon Lab. And I'll be discussing visualizing high dimensional biological data with cluster grammar widget in the Jupyter Notebook. So just as an overview for the talk, um, I'll start with a quick motivating example to, um, to kind of get us started. And then I'll discuss uh, specifically visualizing biological data and the problems that are inherent with that. <clears throat> then discuss building and using a cluster grammar widget, which is a Jupyter widget, which can be used within a notebook. And then finally end with a few case studies and discuss the future directions of the project. Okay, so um, we'll start with uh, Le Miserable. So it's a novel by Victor Hugo and it's considered one of the greatest novels ever written. And so let's say that our goal is to understand the story of Le Miserable, right? So if we want to understand the story, the most straightforward way is just to read the book, right? But it's also one of the longest novels ever written at like 1500 pages. So we, if let's just say we don't have the time to read the book. So what we could do is maybe write a script that goes through and gathers some data and then we can visualize data about this story and try and get some idea of what's happening in the story. So one thing we can do is um, construct a network of the characters in the story as a, um, to get some idea of what's happening. So we can take measurements about these characters and we can basically find out the chapters that these characters occur in and then connect characters based on co-occurrence in the same chapter as a proxy for like their interaction in the story. And, um, and then this interactive example here shows uh, just that network. Uh, it's actually one of the examples from uh, Mike Bostock's uh, D3JS, if you all are familiar. And it's visualizing the network of characters as a ball and stick network. So you can like drag it around. So each node in the network is a character and the links represent co-occurrence in chapters. So if you hover over the node, you'll see the name. So this visualization um, is very straightforward and it allows us to see uh, clusters of different characters. They've been colored different colors. Um, using a, a clustering algorithm to, to identify clusters. And then, so we can kind of see that there's, there's certain structures of, uh, or groups of characters that co-interact. And then we can see like there are like really main characters like uh, Valjean who, who interacts with like a lot of people in the story. So we know this is a really important person. So um, like I said, we could identify main characters, identify clusters. And it's a straightforward and compact visualization, but the weaknesses of the visualization are that there are no labels, so you have to um, hover over the, the nodes to see the labels. And also the links frequently overlap, so you, it kind of turns into like, um, hard to visualize like, exactly what is happening in these areas, because there's like, so much happening. So an alternative way to visualize uh, a network is using an adjacency matrix. So uh, with an adjacency matrix, you have your, um, your characters as columns and rows, and then the cells of your matrix indicate the, their interaction. So we're visualizing the same network as an adjacency matrix, and then you can also see the clusters that you have here. So the, we have this interactive um, notebook version, so or interactive uh, D3JS uh, version from a, another example from uh, Mike Postdoc. So now we can see the same character clusters, and, and similar to the, the actual, um, force-directed uh, ball and stick network, the orientation of our components helps us visualize structures. So here, these characters have been ordered using hierarchical clustering, but we can also change the order so we can, say, order them by name. And now you're gonna lose all that structure. So it's the same data, but like, it's very, you're not seeing the same structure in the data. And then if you order by frequency, like by the total interactions, you can start to see the same, the same main characters again, right? The ranked on number of interactions. So when you think of a network, you we now kind of like know there's two ways to visualize it. And, and one weakness of this is that it's more visually spread out. And a sort of weakness strength is the orientation, like the, um, the way we arrange the data, right? So, um, so we have two ways of, of visualizing the network, but we're missing something, right? So what about the chapters themselves? So the characters, we know they co-occur, but we don't know the specific chapters they co-occur. Do they co-occur at the beginning of the story, at the end of the story? Um, and then also what, like what chapters are related to each other based on character co-occurrence. Like we could make a network of the chapters too, uh, if you sort of flip your, the way of thinking of the data. So this is where a heat map comes in. And um, what we're seeing here, a uh, heat map um, allows you to uh, visualize your data as a matrix. So here we have our characters as columns, and then we have our chapters as rows. And here we're, we're clustering, using hierarchical, hierarchical clustering, both the characters 
and in the columns and the, the chapters here. So we can now see specifically which chapters the characters co-occur in. So you can see these two characters like co-occur throughout the story, these co-occur in this chapter here. And then if you rearrange the data again, you can see other structures. So if you, if you rearrange your rows based on the chapters based on their number, you can see like the flow of the story. So it starts off with these people, and then as the chapters progress, it moves on to these other people, and then these people are here at the end. And then you can, um, you can also reorder your chapters uh, your, your characters by some to see the main characters and, and basically interact with your data that way. So that MotoDB example shows us how we're, how a heat map is really, like you can think of it as like two networks at once, like an adjacency matrix of both networks. But Im important to this is the fact that if we really wanna understand the story, it's only gonna get us so far. Like this is a deeper, under it getting, it's more information than just a network, but you still, like you need to read the story to understand it, right? So now we'll switch over to biology. So I'll just give a very, very quick primer to um, a couple core biology concepts. So um, each, the, the core component of, in biology is a cell, like that's a, the smallest unit. And um, in a cell, you have your, your, your information to make the cell stored in DNA. And uh, by and large, the main component of that is different genes. So you have like, in humans, you have you know, roughly 20, 30,000 genes. Um, the, the information is stored in the DNA, but when you actually um, a cell is really, the working components is, are mainly proteins. So to get to, to, from DNA to proteins, you need to go through RNA, which is, again, by and large, like a sort of temporary working copy of your data. So you don't want to like mess up the DNA, so you have an immutable copy of the DNA, and, uh, and this is how information is transferred. So it's a, it's a very complicated system because you have like trillions of cells in your body, 20,000 genes, uh, 20,000 proteins, you know, maybe more. It's a very, very complicated system. And the biologi biological data we'll be seeing is uh, taking snapshots of these different molecules in cells. So biological data uh, is difficult to visualize. And part of the reason is that it can be high dimensional. And this is just showing a, a, a visualization of a, a huge biological network of um, probably interacting proteins. And it just kind of shows you like the scope of like how complicated the interactions are. Um, so if you, um, if you don't do it well, it becomes very uninterpretable. So for instance, RNA-seq data, you can measure like 20 to 30,000 genes in bulk. Um, flow cytometry, you can measure like 50 or so proteins, but you can measure those 50 or so proteins in like millions of cells. And then single cell RNA-seq is some of the newest data where you can measure the whole expression of every gene, which is about, again, 20,000 genes in thousands of individual cells. So you have matrices that are like really very large for biology. Uh, so one technique to, um, to deal with high dimensional data is to perform dimensionality reduction. And this is uh, just a, a quick example of um, T, S, and E. So two very popular uh, dimensionality reduction algorithms are principal component analysis and uh, T, S, and E, T stochastic neighbor embedding. So this is just showing you um, an embedding of handwritten digits, which can be thought of as high dimensional data points because they ex uh, each pixel can be thought of as a dimension. And then here it's showing a cluster of different digits. So we're seeing that the digits are clustering based on the identity of the digits. So it does a good job of showing us um, clustering of our data points, but it's uh, obscuring the underlying data, right? So if our underlying data is pixels, we may not care that much, but if it's genes, we probably care a lot more about those underlying pixels or underlying data points. So again, like to mirror what we just saw before, we can also um, just directly visualize the data using a heat map. So in this case, we have um, samples as rows here, just, just a toy data set, and we have some genes as columns, and we can, we're directly able to visualize high dimensional data using a heat map, where we have our data points as columns and our dimensions as rows or vice versa, and then again, the arrangement of those is usually done through hierarchical clustering, and you can have a dendrogram show you how your clusters are forming at like higher levels here. Uh, however, static heat maps are limiting because as you add more data, your uh, components of your visualization just become a lot smaller, and it's a lot harder to gather anything useful from it. So one of the goals for, this, for the cluster grammar project was to extend the capabilities of a heat map, enable complex uh, and interactive data exploration, make something that was user friendly and very easy to share without software requirement, and also include certain bio biology specific features. So um, cluster grammar uh, as a visualization tool is a JavaScript tool, and it was built with D3JS, which is uh, data-driven documents. It's a very popular and very powerful uh, library for building customized visualizations. And then the back end of cluster grammar, where the calculations are done, were built, where primarily the cal calculations are done, was done, built using Python. And um, we chose Python because they have uh, really extensive libraries for numerical and scientific uh, purposes. And then it's also general enough so you can build like a web app and obviously real Jupyter notebooks and this kind of thing. So um, I'll just quickly show an example heat map here. 
And uh, so this is our interactive heat map that we built that we showed a little, a little bit earlier, uh, think about. So you can like zoom in and out of your data. And uh, what we have here are uh, lung cancer cell lines. It's just sort of a small toy data set. And then we have uh, the expression of different kinases in those cell lines. So we can hover over them and get information. Uh, we're actually looking up the, um, the RefSeq information about that gene, which helps biologists to, to see their data. And we're actually talking to an API here. Um, but in terms of the data visualization, you can um, reorder your data. So you can reorder your, either your rows or columns based on summer variants to sort of see different structure in your data. And if you have it in cluster view, you can use an interactive dendrogram that's shown as um, slices here. So you can see different uh, levels of clustering in your data. And then you can also um, compare if you've brought in your own prior knowledge, like different categories. So in this case, we have cell lines that have different categories. So if we see, if we want to compare our prior knowledge to our data-driven clustering, we can use the interactive dendrogram to show you how the composition of a cluster based on certain categories, and the Fisher Exact test will tell you the likelihood that that would have happened by chance. So a lot of features were just built to be very generalizable for just data analysis. Um, so that's Cluster Grammar. And uh, we actually built a small app for Cluster Grammar where you can just um, upload your data and, um, and just get a permanent visualization that you can share with, with people. But now on to Jupyter Notebook. So one of our goals was to get Cluster Grammar to run in a Jupyter Notebook. And as I'm sure you're all aware, um, Jupyter Notebooks are, are really ideal for generating reproducible and shareable workflows. And they're kind of like hybrid web apps because you can run them locally, you can share them with people on the web, and they can be run on the web through services like Binder and other uh, Jupyter Hub. So we, um, using the cookie cutter template, the Ju uh, Jupyter widget cookie cutter template, we built Cluster Grammar widget. And um, we, the widget can be thought of from the Python point of view as just a general, or Pandas point of view as a general data frame uh, viewer. So. Let me see. And then uh, one of the, um, about last year, they officially uh, added support for sharing notebooks with interactive widgets. So now you, that means you can have a static notebook, a static HTML file with an embedded widget and embedded data, and you can put that online and uh, share that with people. You can even email them an HTML file and they'll be able to interact with it, which I'll, I'll show later. So, um, okay, well, actually we'll do that now. Um, Okay, so here is an example of Cluster Grammar being used on uh, viewed through NB Viewer. So we ha since it's a JavaScript library, we have all the same interac interactive features we, we showed before. It's just that now it's rendered in a cell in a Jupyter Notebook. But this notebook's actually not executable, and only a subset of the calculations can be done here. So here we're viewing a, um, a, a matrix with just some random data in it. And then here's what it looks like if you actually run the notebook, the same notebook that we saw earlier. So here we're loading a file, um, a TSV file with data, visualizing it, uh, and then below, we're just generating a data frame. Um, whoops. So it's just a data frame with just random numbers, and we're visualizing that. And then we have certain methods we can use, like we can try. Um, So we just z-score the columns just for fun with this random data, and then it changes the way our data looks, and we can do that. So we can basically save this and send it to a, um, a collaborator, and they don't actually have to even run the notebook, but they can interact with the data. Okay, so now we're at, uh, we'll go on to some case studies to kind of get into a little bit more of the weeds of dealing with real data, and also discuss the future directions uh, of the project. So we'll start with the Iris flower data set, then move on, uh, it's sort of a small data set that you might be familiar with, and then move on to the cancer cell line encyclopedia, gene, uh, bulk gene expression data, which is a public data set uh, produced by the Broad Institute. And then finally, we'll show some unpublished um, single cell protein and gene expression data from an assay called SiteSeq. Okay, so the Iris uh, flower data set, um, it's a small, data set in a sense because it only has 150 samples, so 150 flowers, and it's a uh, four-dimensional, so it's a multivariate data set. And there are three flower types, it's Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica, and there's four dimensions. So you have the sepal and petal length and width, right? So one way you can visualize that data is in two dimensions at a time is through the use of scatter plots. So um, this is just an example of visualizing that data where the flowers have been colored based on their category and we're, we're visualizing two dimensions at a time. So like sepal length versus sepal width uh, and et cetera. So you have, with these four dimensions, you need six um, scatter plots to visualize that data. 
And, uh, and you can see like that um, here in blue, like Virginica tends to have like higher petal length and uh, you know, you can sort of see the structure in your data. Um, but you can also visualize the data uh, as a heat map in uh, cluster grammar. So here we're gonna show how we're doing that. And uh, this is again on MB Viewer. Um, so, so here we are loading the iris data set. We're just adding some categories to it, just getting in the format the cluster grammar needs a little bit, which is in the documentation if you're interested. And then now we are visualizing the, this data set as uh, flowers, as columns here. And then we've added a category for the three color types. So we've got Satosa. Uh, you can also reorder by category. So you've got um, Virginica, Versicolor, and Satosa. And then we have the four dimensions here. So one thing that becomes like immediately apparent is, uh, is that these three dimensions are like very redundant with each other. Also the data, has, each dimension has been z-scored across all the flowers just to kind of make them a little bit more comparable. So you can see sepal width is, is doing its own thing, but sepal length is actually behaves very similar to petal length and petal width. So that's something that just really pops out at you. And then um, you, what you see here is that this cluster here is like almost completely composed of Satosa. And, uh, and then you see this cluster here um, at the, at the dendrogram, you can find like different levels of clustering. So you can break it down to smaller clusters or larger clusters. And then if, if you hover over the dendrogram, like you intuitively, it, it looks like there's definitely significant enrichment for that category type in that cluster. And this will on the fly perform um, the Fisher exact test to tell you like what are the odds if you were to have chosen 49 of them that they would have all been Satosa. The odds with a p value on that is like negative 24. So you can find uh, immediately compare your prior knowledge to your data driven clustering. Um, and then you can like reorder on a particular thing and say like, okay, you know, if I just rank on Sepal with how good of a job do I do at breaking down my categories? So, so it just allows you to interactively explore your data. And, um, and it's, it's pretty versatile. So, okay, so the next example we'll go over is some uh, bulk gene expression data from the cell, cell, or sorry, cancer cell line encyclopedia from the Broad Institute. So this is a, a much bigger data set. So it includes 1,037 cancer cell lines. Um, it's, this is just showing you a breakdown of the number of tissue types in those 1,037 cell lines. So you've got 20 different tissue types. It's mainly composed of lung, hematopoietic lymphoid tissue, um, and then you have like central nervous system, skin, large intestine. So it's a good data set to explore with cluster grammar. Um, let me see. So we'll, we're just going to uh, investigate a certain subset of that data. So we're going to look at some uh, gene expression. And this is, is, uh, is gene expression data. So we're going to look at some gene expression data in some bone cancers. So I think we have it preloaded here, yeah. So again, we're, we're in MB Viewer, and we're, we're uh, basically we're loading the full data set. So we have, it has 18,000 rows and 1,037 columns. And um, so because Cluster Grammar can't visualize that much data at once, we're just grabbing a subset of the data based on um, bone. So we're grabbing a category here. And then here we're filtering to only show the top 250 variable genes. So now if you look at this, the top category, bone, all of, the, all of our cell lines here as columns are bone. And then we have the top 250 most, um, the genes with the highest variance across all these cell lines. So this is helping us see differences between our bone cancer cell lines. So we don't just have the tissue, we're also given like the histology, subhistology, and, um, and, and, and actually the gender and this kind of thing. So one thing we can see right off the bat is that you have this cluster here of cell lines that behaves like very different than the rest of bone cancer cell lines. And if you look at the category, it's mostly composed of Ewing sarcoma, uh, peripheral primitive neuroectodermal tumor, but the takeaway is that it's a neuroectodermal tumor. And if you look at the other, um, but it's not completely, like uh, not all of them fall in that cluster. There's two other cell lines here that um, cluster with the other histology types. So the other uh, breakdowns are, are just different, different breakdown, different subtypes of bone cancer. And what we've done here is overlay um, prior knowledge using a, a web API call, um, or a web tool built by the Mayan lab called Enricher. So like the column categories, we brought in that information, right? But since everybody in biology is pretty much dealing with genes, we have an a, a enormous amount of prior knowledge that we can bring in. And, uh, and you can either bring in that information or we have a, an API that allows you to bring in that information through a process called enrichment analysis. So what we did here was actually preload the heat map with enrichment analysis for um, gene ontology biological process. So enrichment analysis is a method where you have prior knowledge list of genes and you basically ask the question, I have a list of genes over here uh, is this list enriched for some 
some process or category or some other list. Like, uh, and, and what are the odds that that would happen by chance? So, so what we can see here is that uh, for broad biological processes, we have enrichment for extracellular matrix organization, um, extracellular structure organization, uh, matrix disassembly, uh, collagen fibril organization. So these are things from a biological perspective that sort of makes sense because it's bone cancer you're looking at, and this is variability across bone cancer. But importantly, we can see that uh, here, like the actual uh, genes that are that fall into these categories, they're all located in this bottom cluster here, right? So this this lower cluster here, are it, all the enriched terms are for the most part not involved in, with these genes here. They're only involved with the ones in the bottom, right? So you kind of have two separate things going on. So uh, what I'll quickly demonstrate is how we can use this crop button here to investigate a subcluster of genes there in, this, in this cluster of interest. So now we've cropped the, um, the matrix on the front end, and we're only looking at the, the genes in the cluster that is mostly enriched for um, this neuroectodermal tumor. So we can rerun the enrichment analysis and um, for uh, biological process. And this is actually sending this arbitrary list of genes that we found here. It's uh, talking to, a, it's using cross origin requests to just send that to a web API. And then uh, now it's getting back the enrichment analysis information. So, uh, so you could basically like crop a, an arbitrary list of genes and, and do enrichment analysis on it. So what we see here, the new terms that are enriched are uh, cerebral cortex migration, uh, neuron migration, behavior, um, and then like glial cell. Um, so these are more uh, neuronal related terms, like central ner nervous system, this kind of thing. So it, it matches the histology of the primitive neuroectodermal tumor. So if we didn't know these were primitive neuroectodermal tumor tumors, we would be able to get some like, inkling or some, some hint of, the pr of what's actually happening in those cell lines by using enrichment analysis um, on the gene level data. Okay. So, yeah, the, this more or less goes over what we discussed. Um, okay, so now I'll move on to the, uh, the last example data set we have. So the, um, I'll be discussing some data uh, from a CITESEQ experiment. So uh, CITESEQ stands for Cellular Indexing of Transcriptomes and Epitopes by Sequencing. And it's an uh, assay that was the, or technique that was developed uh, in New York at the New York Genome Center and uh, recently published in Nature Methods in 2017, down here. Um, so basically, what, what we were looking at before was bulk gene expression data, meaning that you were measuring gene expression levels of like you know millions of cells. So uh, newer techniques are coming out where you using microfluidics and droplets and beads with um, biochemical enzymes that basically allow you to measure gene expression in on individual cells. So here, like you're seeing, you've got cells and beads coming together, forming tiny droplets of uh, water that are suspended in oil, and you can perform all the all the biochemistry necessary to to um, to amplify their gene expression. But for our purposes, uh, all we're gonna we're gonna say is that this method allows us to measure about 30,000 genes, about 50 proteins, and uh, and do that for about 10,000 single cells. So it's a, Pretty big data set, pretty complicated. And the reason we're measuring proteins and genes separately is because um, this, we're actually able to uh, relatively well characterize cell types based on their surface markers. So, so we're kind of focusing in, you can think of the, of the surface marker protein data as a means to identify well-known subtypes of cells, uh, in this case immune cells, whereas the genes offer a more unbiased view of what's happening because you're just looking at basically everything. And then we can compare that. So for this, to, to analyze this data, we, we need a, a more powerful visualization tool than what we currently have. And this is where WebGL comes in. So um, what we've been working on recently is rebuilding the front end of uh, Cluster Grammar in uh, WebGL. And we're using a library called Regal. So, um, and the new widget I'm calling is uh, Cluster Grammar Glidget, as in like WebGL and Widget and Glidget. Uh, so um, WebGL enables uh, GPU accelerated visualization of large data, large data sets. Um, and you'll, you'll see uh, here is just uh, the Regal website. So a lot of WebGL stuff is 3D, but what we're doing is 2D, but you're using the same technology. Okay, so now uh, just to give a, a quick example on the old data set we had before, this was um, the, the, the speed at which we we're dealing with a 250 by 250 matrix, but now with the new WebGL um, implementation. We scroll down, let's see. So now this is a thousand by a thousand, and um, we can zoom in like much faster and interact with it much more easily. And then, let's see if this works. We can also like reorder things and handle like tons of data. 
So um, this is just giving you an uh, uh, idea of like how much more powerful WebGL is than the SVG implementation. So it allows us to work with much, much bigger data sets. Okay, so now I'll, we'll jump back to the SiteSeq data. So, so dealing with this single cell data really has driven us to, to develop more powerful visualization tools. And the specific data set that I'll be sharing with you here is a data set from peripheral blood mononuclear cells. So these are different immunological cells uh, from, um, from a human sample. So in this particular experiment, we've uh, used SiteSeq to measure 37 surface markers, uh, about 30,000 genes, and about over 15,000 cells uh, were measured. So let me see. So now I'll show some of the results in um, some uh, static HTML notebooks. So here we're just loading the data. We've got 37 um, markers by around 20,000 cells. And then here we're visualizing a subset of these cells here as columns. And we've got our 37 dimensions here. So if you hover over, you can, um, it'll tell you the, the cell type. So we can, what we've got here is um, unbiased clustering. Uh, so we're doing a hierarchical clustering of our cells and our, our markers. And we can see that we, uh, the cell, cells tend to cluster based on cell type. And this cell type here was determined using a semi-manual uh, method. So basically, we're seeing good agreement between our semi-manual dimensionality reduction cell type identification and our just totally unbiased cell type identification. And you can zoom in and see uh, each cell actually is encoded by a, um, a barcode. So if you zoom in sufficiently, you'll see that uh, DNA uh, barcode. So one thing we can see here, like if you, we're, now we're, we're z-scoring the data across the cell, so it kind of makes it a little bit more apparent what's happening. And you can see here you've got like CD8 is high here. So if you hover over, you'll see that these are CD8 cells, CD8 T cells, and they're in red here. Um, yeah, and then, uh, and then you can like, um, we've also labeled uh, doublets using the black category here. So, um, we can, we can see the doublets are clustering next to each other and they kind of have like too many markers that are active. And then the next thing we can do is to take the, so basically we've identified the cells based on their surface marker data, but now we can look at the sort of more broad, unbiased gene expression data. So here we just took a very general method where we took a subsample of um, 5,000 genes. So this, this matrix has 5,000 columns and we're looking at the top 500 variable genes across those uh, across these 5,000 cells. So now we can zoom in and see specifically like which genes are being um, upregulated in specific cell types. So like if we zoom in here, we've got um, CD16 monocytes, and then we can zoom in and see the specific genes that are up and down regulated in, the, in that cell type. Um, and then we can also go a little deeper and we can take a particular cell type of interest like CD8 uh, CD8 T cells, and then we can cluster just those cells specifically. And then now uh, this, this category here is uh, labeling the subtypes of CD8. So what this is showing us is that um, there's very good agreement between the protein level data and the gene expression data, even though they're pretty much independent data sets. And um, it's, uh, it's giving us a lot, of, a lot of confidence in our assay, and it's also enabling, enabling us to identify new uh, subtypes of cells and also to identify the differentially expressed genes within those cell types. And then the visualization enables us to share, um, to share the data with our, our uh, biology uh, collaborators and our researchers who aren't necessarily going to run a Jupyter notebook. But now we can share a big data set with them uh, just as a private HTML file and they can interact with it. And then once they're ready to publish, we can put that online and we can share this uh, through NB Viewer. And then obviously this kind of thing could also be used uh, through services like MyBinder in, in, in the future. So yeah, that's about um, it. So there's a couple links to some other examples. We have an example using the the MNIST data set, uh, kind of a fun one using USDA nutrients um, data. And then um, we already went over the, the CCLE Glidget example. Um, so the project itself is, uh, is open source. So the, the JavaScript libraries are Cluster Grammar JS or Cluster Grammar GL for the WebGL. And then um, Cluster Grammar PY is the back end. And then we have the widget and the new WebGL Glidget. And uh, documentation is um, here on uh, read the docs. So it's um, pretty well documented and um, has everything about the formats and everything, and it's pip installable, and then it was uh, recently published in uh, Nature Scientific Data uh, last year. And um, thank you for your attention. I would just like to acknowledge everyone at the um, Human Immune Monitoring Center, uh, especially uh, Miriam Murad and uh, Deeb, Sungi, and Sasha, 
And the computational team there, uh, Melanie and Manuel, um, everybody's very uh, good and high quality there. And then the, the cluster grammar widget was developed during uh, the time I was a postdoc in the Avi Mayans lab. So just to acknowledge uh, some of the people in Avi's lab. And um, our collabor we collaborated with Salcidolene Technology. And then also my wife, uh, Dawn Fernandez, and her uh, PI, she's a postdoc um, in the uh, John O'Reilly lab. And, uh, and then just also, to, I would really like to acknowledge all the open source developers that made all these tools possible because the project would just definitely not have been possible without all the open source tools that exist. Not to mention the help from everybody on message boards that, that just are like extremely helpful. And uh, thank you to JupyterCon for letting me present. Thanks.